Last Thursday, Tesla began official deliveries of the Model S Plaid, its fastest, quickest, and most expensive Model S variant to date. With a sprint time of just two seconds, and capable of hitting nearly double that in as much time as it takes most cars to do the standard stoplight derby, the Model S Plaid says a lot about the Tesla of today. If the original Model S was proof that Tesla had what it took to build a series production car at volume, then the Model S Plaid shows that Tesla is capable of turning what is a pretty long-in-the-tooth exterior design and making it fresh again through iterative design, unconventional thinking, and a desire to continue to innovate, no matter what. It's also an exercise in marketing genius, by leveraging pop culture references in its very name, creating a buzz and a fervour among new and existing fans that will keep interest high for many months, Model S Plaid will most certainly boost Tesla until the Cybertruck is here. And based on the number of existing Tesla customers who now report their already quick cars feel slow, customers who have plenty of money to burn on a new Tesla, I might add, I think it will also make Tesla a lot of money. And I anticipate that the majority of Model S Plaid customers will be existing Tesla customers upgrading rather than conquest buyers from other brands. But that's not what I want to talk to you about today, nor do I want to talk to you about the impressive torque curve of the trio of motors in the Model S Plaid, or the new interior, at least from a passenger point of view. We covered all of that back in our Tesla Q4 earnings video here. Instead, I want to talk to you about the unconventional controls that the redesigned Model S and Model X bring to the table. The fact that Tesla has replaced a traditional steering wheel with a yoke-like setup. The fact that the wheel-mounted windscreen wiper stalk, indicators, and light controls found in most modern cars are nowhere to be seen. And the fact that these refreshed Model S and X don't have anything near a conventional gear selector and instead use Tesla's autopilot hardware sensors and GPS data to figure out which direction you want the car to travel in. The whole thing has caused quite a stir online. At one end, you've got people excitedly talking about how Tesla is trailblazing the car of the future today, explaining how there's no need for traditional controls anymore. On the other hand, you've got people in a cold sweat, explaining how scared they are that Tesla's automatic gear selector will fail and lead to the car to crash into something or someone. Or perhaps worrying about Tesla trying to fix something that wasn't actually broken, and then making it worse. Everyone uses standardised controls, they argue. So why can't Tesla? While it might feel like that, car controls remained fairly standard over the last 50 years or so, it's worth remembering that it wasn't always that way. And while most automakers have gravitated towards a fairly uniform layout for essential vehicle controls, even today, there are some weird outliers. So today, I'm going to examine how you operate Tesla's refreshed Model S and X, select gears and operate indicators, explain the reasoning behind that new yoke-like steering wheel, explain some of the advantages and disadvantages of the new setup, and then show you why, categorically, homogenized vehicle controls are far from the norm through the past 100 years. So let's start with selecting gears. With Tesla's vision-based autopilot system now standard on all Teslas, Tesla CEO Elon Musk explained during the Tesla Model S Plaid delivery event that traditional gear selectors are no longer required because the car is capable of inferring your desired direction simply by looking at its surroundings. It's a feature Tesla calls Auto Shift Out of Park, and it's a beta feature that's not turned on by default, but which drivers can opt to turn on through an on-screen menu. With Auto Shift Out of Park enabled and you parked forward in a garage, for example, the car can see that there's a wall in front of it, and so it will select Reverse to allow you to back out of the garage. When you've backed out, and the car can see a clear path ahead, it will automatically pick forwards. And if the car infers that you're in the middle of, say, a multi-point low-speed turn, it will also try to guess which way you need to go next. The onus, of course, is on the driver to make sure that the car moves in the right direction and to respond quickly if the car starts to go in the wrong direction. But if that scares you, and I think it would scare me until I got a chance to try it myself, it is important to reiterate that Tesla's Auto Shift Out of Park is a beta feature. But there are also two other ways to change gear. You can swipe up on the left-hand side of the car's centre touchscreen to select forwards, and then swipe down to select reverse. Also, if you prefer, there are capacitive touch buttons on the centre console just below the inductive charging area for your mobile phone. Pressing one of these buttons will allow you to change gear, 
but you'll also need to tap one of the buttons first to wake up that gear selection system, at least according to the Tesla manual I've read. In short then, you can use manual gear selectors to select which direction your Tesla moves, and for now, the auto shift out of park is not activated as standard. Next, let's look at directional indicators. Traditionally, you'll see an indicator stalk attached to the car's steering wheel, but Tesla has moved the indicators to the wheel itself in the form of two capacitive touch buttons on the left-hand side of the steering wheel. Tap the directional indicator you desire, left pointing arrow for left and right pointing arrow for right, and the indicator will flash briefly. Press and hold for a little longer and the indicator will latch, cancelling itself under just the same circumstances as a traditional indicator stalk would. In the same way, while most people look for a way to turn on lights in most cars, or at least switch between high and low beams with the same stalk as the indicator, Tesla has moved headlight control to another capacitive touch button on the steering wheel. Since Tesla includes automatic lighting with its cars, most drivers won't have to touch it, but it's there should you wish to have manual control. Of course, at this point, I should remind you that Tesla has, for a while now, with Model 3 and Model Y, done away with a traditional windscreen wiper control stalk. But you've guessed it, it's automatic and you can also access wipers from the steering wheel via one of the two scroll buttons on the wheel itself. Or you can activate through the center touchscreen display. Some people like this arrangement in the 3 and Y, so shouldn't feel too wigged out by the same operation in S and X. But for those coming to the car from a more traditional model, well, it is going to take a while to get used to it. That said, not everyone likes the auto wiper function, including Winter, who was fairly critical of them in his recent video on his used Model 3 long range rear wheel drive. You can see it here. Which brings me to the why of all of this, including why Tesla is using a yoke-like wheel. Elon Musk has maintained for a long time now, more than six years in fact, that Teslas of the near future will not need a human to drive them. You will, he says, be driven by your car, and thus you won't need to worry about all of the manual control surfaces that a traditional car has. That is part of the logic behind removing some of the stalks and buttons you'd find in a conventional car, and the reason why Tesla wants the yoke to become the norm. After all, if you're not holding the wheel in the car of the future, why does it need to be a wheel? Right now, all cars must have a steering control of some form, although, fun fact, in most places, it doesn't have to be a wheel. Musk said during the Plaid delivery event that removing the top of the wheel makes it a lot easier to see the digital display behind the wheel in Model S and X, and it makes it easier to see what autopilot is doing when autopilot is active. Again, Musk, and thus Tesla, is looking to a future where you won't be using the wheel that much, so minimizing its form factor while retaining required functionality does make some sense. However, while some folks lust after a yoke-style wheel, after all, yokes are used in many airplanes, those who've tried to use them in cars are split between loving them and hating them. In single-seat racing cars, where they're most common, the gearing of the steering is high enough that the lock-to-lock -lock motion of the wheel is usually no more than about 360 degrees, so a yoke makes absolute sense. In most normal cars, that steering wheel lock is closer to seven or 800 degrees, and because they have round wheels, you can shuffle or skip the wheel quite easily between your hands. So unless Tesla has changed its steering gearing for the new Model S or X, I'm guessing it might annoy some people, although I do believe you can still order a conventional steering wheel if you prefer, though I haven't been able to clarify that with Tesla because it doesn't have a press department anymore. With that all out of the way, let's look at some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages of Tesla's brand new setup. Advantage-wise, making everything digital rather than physical reduces complexity in the building of the car, and it reduces the number of physical moving parts required for each vehicle. And with everything operating in software through capacitive buttons, Tesla can modify or add functionality over time with driver feedback or improvements in autonomous vehicle technology. Remember that right now, as of filming this, full self-driving is not a globally available feature that any Tesla owner can just simply activate. The disadvantages? Well, they're also pretty obvious. Those who aren't familiar with Tesla's new setup will inevitably find it noticeably harder to operate the car, at least at first. Intuition will vary from one person to another, and just how quickly each driver adapts will depend on how flexible they are with driving. 
For those who only ever drive one car and have gotten so used to where the various gauges and dials are at second nature, I'm predicting this new setup will cause a great deal of discomfort. But for those who adapt well, it'll be just a few weeks and then most likely it'll feel like second nature like the hand-mounted brake on my Bolt EV. Which brings me to the final point of this video, standardized controls. You see, we've got fairly used to the idea of standardized car controls across large parts of the auto industry. The right pedal is the go pedal and the left pedal is the brake, unless you're in a stick shift or manual car, in which case the left pedal is the clutch and the middle pedal is the brake. The wheel is what you use to control the car's steering and the stalks on the left hand side of the wheel control things like lights and indicators, while the ones on the right traditionally control the windshield wipers. And it really is just some cars that follow this. And I've driven cars with no wiper controls or indicators on any stalks anywhere near the wheel. The Citroen CX, for example, had a single spoke steering wheel and no column mounted controls. You had to use a series of switches mounted on the instrument cluster behind the wheel. And when it came out, I'm pretty sure people complained about it not being standard. And if you take a stroll through the history books, it becomes pretty clear that what Tesla's doing isn't so unusual. For many years, light controls for high and dip beams on cars were foot operated, or they were mounted in the center of the car on toggle switches. And as for the steering wheel? Well, steering wheels weren't always the way that we controlled cars. Early cars, both internal combustion and electric, tended towards tillers rather than wheels. And when we did finally become standardized about steering wheels, they often included rings on the wheels for controlling the engine mixture and idle speed. And even in the last few decades, we've seen vehicles come to market with no conventional steering wheels. The Twike of the late 90s and early noughties was one such vehicle. Because it was available with both an electric and electric human hybrid drivetrain, it used a central tiller to control the direction it traveled. And while learning curves were steep for first time pilots, they soon got used to it and often frankly enjoyed it more than a car with a steering wheel. Then we get to the matter of gear shifting, which is honestly as varied and as wonderful as the auto industry is old. We might like to think that most cars are fairly standardized gear selectors, but they don't. You can get touch button ones, you can get steering wheel mounted ones, you can get little hockey puck style selectors or sequential gear selector mechanisms. And when you get to manual transmissions, well, they're even more exciting with a plethora of different gear gate patterns, gear cake positions and lever designs. The fundamentals of shifting between them might be similar, but the actual process of selecting a gear you have to relearn and retrain your muscles for every car you drive to become thoroughly competent and efficient in your shifting. If you go back through history far enough, it gets weirder. The Model T Ford may look like it has three normal pedals for you to use, but each pedal does something very different to a modern manual transmission car. Even its brakes operate differently. And then some military vehicles made in the last 70 years or so had such a weird layout between say brake, clutch and accelerator, one truck I drove had the former behind the latter, that it takes a while to get used to driving them. And then commercial vehicles were also different. Some buses in the 1940s, for example, had extra controls to allow the driver to pre-select the next gear and then pushing a particular pedal engaged that pre-selected gear. My point? While we like to convince ourselves that vehicle controls have remained exactly the same since the beginning of time, they really haven't. And while I personally have preferred the more traditional control layout for Model S and X, and I am very leery of letting my car decide which direction I want it to go, I'm also willing to accept that over time, humans have adapted to new cockpit controls, layouts, and switch gears. And I don't think Tesla's refresh Model S and X will be any different. That said, I do think that Tesla solved a problem that nobody really had in the first place. And frankly, it does certainly feel a little as if Tesla is just trying to be different because Tesla. Let me know if you agree or disagree with me in the comments below. That's it. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.